Tom Schwartz, the director, and I'm pleased you chose to join us today. For those of you who heard Tom Tudor's Veterans Day talk about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and his own service as a tomb guard and commander of the Relief Sentinel, you know what a great and engaging speaker we have here today. For those of you who missed it, you're in for a great treat. Thomas W. Tudor is a Hawkeye, having graduated from Theodore Roosevelt High School in Des Moines, elected to the Theodore Roosevelt High School Alumni Hall of Fame, and a graduate of the University of Iowa. For some unknown reason, he currently resides in Colorado. <laughs> Besides his services as Sentinel, then Relief Commander at Arlington, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier from February 1969 to Memorial Day of 1970, he's past president of the Society of the Honor Guard, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and member of the board. A successful business owner and five-time Rotary International Club president, Tudor boasts of a happy marriage and a proud father of two daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tom Tudor. Thank you, Tom. Greatly appreciate that introduction. And thank you, Lynn, for your technical assistance uh, the other day and today again. Uh, uh, I'm going to guess that some of you were here on the 100th anniversary of the armistice um, on November November the 11th. Um, but I'm going to just do a little bit of what I call backfill, because uh, if you weren't here, uh, I do want to just give you the brief, just a little, a little brief rundown about guarding the tomb. I will tell you, guarding the tomb was the hardest job I ever loved. It was the final resting place of over 400,000 American service men and women and their next of kin. Um, now there are 400,000 stories, but I have picked some that I think will resonate to share because uh, I've been speaking about Arlington for 32 years, and I used to try to incorporate these into, a, into the whole presentation, and it got to be so long and cumbersome, so I created this as, as its own entity. Arlington is the only national cemetery that has veterans from all of our nation's wars from the Revolution forward. So, there are 11 Revolutionary War soldiers buried in Arlington. I'm going to talk about two of them. The first one is buried right here on the front lawn of the Arlington House. And his name is Pierre Charles L'Enfant. Pierre Charles L'Enfant was a Frenchman who was recruited by uh, Pierre Beaumarchais and came over in 1777 at the age of 23. He was born in 1754 and worked as a combat engineer or a military engineer for Washington. He also served under Lafayette's command. Um, and uh, uh, Washington became aware that he had been trained in engineering and design in Paris. His father was a, uh, also Pierre Charles L'Enfant, was a uh, well-known artist to the court of, uh, of Louis XV. Um, and so uh, he assigned him the task of, of coming up with a plan for the new federal city, the District of Columbia. And so he came up with a plan in 1791. Um, um, he, had, uh, he had some issues with, uh, with the commission, and the commission uh, fired him. Uh, he, uh, he fought uh, bitterly to, for compensation, but he was, he was compensated uh, finally. But he died in poverty in 1825 and was buried on a friend's farm in Prince George's County, Maryland. And in 1909, uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution, along with the federal government, decided that it was time to bring him back to the District of Columbia, or close to the District of Columbia that he designed. And so, in 1909, they brought his remains back to the front lawn of the Arlington House and buried them right on the front lawn. And uh, this structure, and looks like a coffee table, okay? Um, the coffee table was not there originally, uh, but they, they, they didn't find much of it. 
two teeth, two small bones, and some green fuzz. But they buried him in this crypt here, um, in a metal line coffin, and put him in, in here. And then uh, in 1911, they dedicated this, and he is, he's got one of the best views in the district, overlooking his grand design for the Grand Mall. Of course, running all the way from the Potomac River, where the Lincoln Memorial is now, all the way to, the, uh, to Jenkins Hill, or uh, the, uh, what, he called, what he called a pedestal awaiting a monument, uh, the, uh, the U.S. Capitol building. Of course, uh, um, this is on the cover, this is on the top of his grave, which is sort of the grand design for his mall. Now this design never really came to fruition until about the last uh, 50 years, because in World War II there were Department of Defense temporary buildings all over the mall. There was even at one point railroad, uh, railroad tracks that ran across the mall. Uh, so uh, the Lafont plan uh, of 1791 has actually, uh, has actually basically come to fruition. Um, another Revolutionary War veteran, James McCubbin Lingen. James McCubbin Lingen has the distinction of most likely being the first American to die for the First Amendment, freedom of the press. And uh, of course, knowing a little bit about uh, about Arlington uh, and, and its history, and I, I, I shared that in, in November, that the, um, the Arlington House and the Arlington Plantation was where Robert E. Lee lived. Robert E. Lee never, never owned the property, but he lived there with his wife, who was the, uh, who was the daughter of the, uh, of the guy who built the, the mansion, George Washington Park Custis. But James McCubbin Lingen received an urgent message from a friend who was a publishing uh, a paper in Baltimore that was critical of the United States fighting Britain in the War of 1812, after the war had already, uh, already begun. And he and a third party, a friend of his, went to his defense. And uh, they tried to keep the crowd from, uh, from, killing, uh, from killing their friend, Alexander Hansen, the publisher uh, of, a, of a newspaper called the American Republic. That was, that was critical, that was, he was printing articles that were critical of fighting the British again, and the crowd was having none of it. And uh, they, they, they ran for their lives. They ran to the a nearby jail, and they begged the jailer to put him in a cell. And the jailer put him in a cell, and the mob came in, beat the jailer up, took the keys, and dragged the three of them, Lingen, Hansen, and the third party, whose name was White Horse Harry Lee the father of Robert E. Lee, they dragged him out and beat him to death, or what they thought was to death. They even poured hot wax into Lee's eyes. This was not a nice group of people. Uh, and they actually left him for dead. And uh, um, Henry Lee survived. Um, of course, he, uh, um, uh, he had been in debtor's prison. He was sort of a deadbeat, uh, deadbeat dad. Uh, ultimately, to Robert E. Lee, but uh, um, uh, Lingen died, and Lingen was buried elsewhere in Georgetown, and his remains were brought over uh, in uh, about 1912 to uh, to rest on the Arlington Plantation, of course, which was inhabited by Robert E. Lee. The person who gave the eulogy at his funeral was George Washington Park Custis father-in-law of Robert E. Lee and the eventually and, and one-time owner of this property where he is buried. And his, uh, his plea in the eulogy was, O oh, oh Maryland, would that the waters of the Chesapeake erase this foul stain from thy soul, the mob violence that had killed this uh, Revolutionary War hero, James McCubbin Lingen. And 14 unknown soldiers from the War of 1812, symbolic of all who made the supreme sacrifice in that war, their remains were discovered in 1905 when they were digging foundations, uh, footings for a new, uh, a new addition to the uh, Washington Navy Yard um, along the Anacostia River. Uh, they, they could not identify who they were, obviously, but they could identify the time period by the buttons on the coats, etc. And so they uh, brought them all together over and put them in a mass grave and uh, buried them in Arlington National Cemetery. Um, and of course, this is the Arlington House, uh, and directly down the hill is the 
Kennedy grave site. And it was said that in March of 1963, JFK had come and stood out here by the flagpole in front of the Arlington House and looked out over Washington and said, I could stay here forever. Well, he got his wish. Because straight down the hill, directly in line from here, his grave, the Memorial Bridge and the Lincoln Memorial are all in a straight line. And that is why Jackie Kennedy chose the spot that she chose. She had three, there were three spots under consideration. One was up near the Mass of Maine, one was near Dewey Circle, and this was the final and, and the final choice, the one that she made. Um, just right behind these bushes, or these trees, I guess, over here, they've cleaned all this up now. You can see, this is, uh, Lafont's grave is behind here. You can't even see it, but it's here. But right down here, off the end of the steps, just down the, down the slope, is the grave of Mary Randolph. Well, why does Mary Randolph end up in Arlington? Well, she was a cousin of Mrs. Custis. And she died in 1828 while visiting. And they decided to bury her right by the front, right by the front porch. She was the first person of European descent to be buried on the Arlington plantation or the Arlington property, or what would become Arlington National Cemetery. Of course, this is 30, uh, 36 years before it becomes a cemetery. But uh, they decided to bury her there. Uh, and uh, the only other burials that had taken place were African-American slaves who were buried down near what is now the visitor center. There was a slave graveyard. Of course, they were put in unmarked graves. So Mary Randolph was Virginia royalty. She was a direct descendant of John Rolfe and Pocahontas on her mother's side. Her, her father, Thomas Mann Randolph, was a governor of Virginia. And her brother, also Thomas Mann Randolph, married Martha Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson's eldest daughter, and was Thomas Jefferson's son-in-law. Uh, but she also had another claim to fame. She wrote a book called The Virginia Housewife, and it was a bestseller from the 1820s until the, about 1850, and it was the Betty Crocker of her day. It told how to make um, nice meals, inexpensive, uh, inexpensive ways that were, that were, that were thrifty, and uh, so when she died in 1828, she was buried here. Now, I do not know the exact story of why this wall was built. To keep people out or keep her in? But my guess, my best guess, is that during the Civil War, one of the generals, possibly Irvin McDowell, possibly McClellan, one of the commanders of the Army of the Potomac that was, uh, was headquartered here, said, we don't want our soldiers sitting on Mary Randolph's grave anymore, so they built this wall keep the uh, keep the Union soldiers off. Um, this is the grave of George Washington Park Custis, and this is the grave of Mary Lee Fitzhugh Custis. Um, and of course, George Washington Park Custis was the adoptive grandson and then eventually the adoptive son of George Washington and considered the last of the Washingtons. Um, Washington had no, uh, no uh, biological children, but when he married Martha Dandridge Custis, uh, in 1757, or 1759, on January the 6th, uh, he immediately adopted uh, the children, John Park Custis, and then John Park's son. When John Park Custis died in 1781, leaving the property, of course, to, uh, to his only out, his only offspring, George Washington Park Custis. And there's Mary Lee Custis. Mary Lee Fitzhugh Custis. And, uh, uh, Robert E. Lee and his wife, Mary Anna Randolph Custis, were related in three different ways. They were third cousins to the Carter family. They were third cousins once removed um, through the Randolphs, and they were uh, also uh, distantly related to the Lee family. And then she was uh, she had a Lee in her name. Robert Todd Lincoln is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. If you're familiar with Arlington, uh, once you go through the front gates, if you take the first road that goes right. There's a path that goes up the hill, and it goes to Robert Todd Lincoln's grave, and it also goes farther up the hill to William Howard Taft's grave. That's a great trivia question. Everybody knows JFK is buried in Arlington. The other trivia question is, who's the other president buried in Arlington? And that is William Howard Taft, and of course his wife Helen, Hel uh, Helen Heron Taft. Robert Todd Lincoln was the firstborn, 1843, of uh, 
of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, he uh, was very successful in his own right. Of course, he was, uh, um, he was a lawyer. He was uh, Harvard educated. Um, and uh, he tried, he tried to, to get into the Union Army, but um, uh, Mary Todd refused to uh, grant him permission. And right at the uh, last, last couple of weeks of the war, he was uh, finally assigned as an officer, a junior officer in, uh, in Grant's staff. But um, Robert Todd Lincoln grew uh, to be uh, the only one of the Lincoln, four Lincoln boys to get past uh, 18. Uh, Thomas or Tad Lincoln died at age 18. Um, Eddie died at age four, and Willie, I believe, died at age 11. That is Robert Todd Lincoln. He was uh, Secretary of War for James Garfield and was in the crowd in an eyewitness to Garfield's shooting. He was invited to Ford's Theater the night his father was shot, but did not go. He showed up later to try to comfort his hysterical mother and, and, uh, and was, uh, was at the bedside, at the deathbed of his father, and wept openly at his uh, father's bed, uh, deathbed. But uh, Robert Todd Lincoln became uh, uh, Secretary of War for Garfield. Uh, he was also uh, in, in the proximity uh, at the, uh, the Pan-American Exposition at Buffalo, New York, when McKinley was shot. So uh, he, he refused to go to anything where the president was to be in attendance from that, from that day forward. Now, this was the last known public photo taken of him on uh, the 30th of May, Memorial Day of 1922. Uh, he lived until 1926. But you can see a little bit of his father, his ears and his eyes, I think. But uh, here's, here he is with Warren G. Harding and then William Howard Taft slimmed down version of William Howard Taft after he got out of the presidency and went to the Supreme Court. Uh, but uh, Warren G. Harding did not die right away. But 14 months and three days later, he was dead of what uh, some think, believe was a heart attack in San Francisco. So the, uh, the, the curse didn't uh, take, take effect immediately. But uh, Robert Todd Lincoln, of course, uh, was married to an island. Mary Eunice Harlan. Mary Eunice Harlan was born in Iowa City in 1846. And her father was James Harlan. And James Harlan was uh, um, uh, the uh, president of Iowa Wesleyan uh, uh, from 1853 to 1855. When, uh, when she lived in Iowa City, her father was, uh, was uh, superintendent of public education. Uh, and some say for the state of Iowa, some just say for Iowa City. He was also president of Iowa City College. Of course, we all remember that great institution. <laughs> Go Hucklets or whatever. <laughs> I don't think it lasted too long. Okay? Uh, but um, I just drove down yesterday to the Harlan Lincoln House. And so there is a place where, uh, where Robert Todd Lincoln and his wife would come to, to escape the oppressive heat of the East Coast to come out west to the wonderful, fresh, fresh, dry air of Iowa <laughs> and, and Mount Pleasant, Iowa for the summer to, uh, to, to, escape, to, to escape the oppressive, oppressive uh, conditions back east. Um, Robert Todd Lincoln had three children. One of them was Abraham Lincoln II. A lot of people are not aware that such a person existed. Um, he and Mary Harlan, uh, Mary, uh, uh, Mary Harlan Lincoln, uh, had two girls and a boy, uh, Jesse and Mary. Mary. Mary's nickname was Mamie. And then uh, this young man, and he was studying in France in 1890 while his uh, father was ambassador to the court of St. James. He was ambassador to Great Britain, and he developed an infection in his armpit, and it killed him. Something, of course, you just give antibiotics for today. In 1890, there weren't any antibiotics, but they were, they were able to get him across the channel and to be with his family uh, at the end. They were trying to, of course, uh, of course uh, nurse him back to health, and uh, it didn't work. But um, uh, one of the girls, of course, uh, um, of course, uh, this is the other Mary Lincoln, Mary Harlan Lincoln. 
and she is buried there in Arlington with Robert Todd Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln II. Uh, wife, Mary Harlan Lincoln. Now, also buried in Arlington is William Howard Taft. William Howard Taft, of course, uh, was president after Theodore Roosevelt, and of course Roosevelt said he wouldn't run against, he wouldn't run again. Uh, and of course, Gus, you know, we all know what happened in uh, 1912. But uh, William Howard Taft is buried uh, in Arlington National Cemetery, the only, the only president to have gone on and served on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, he was Chief Justice of the United States uh, from his appointment by Harding, I believe, in 1920, uh, um, 1923 uh, until his death in 1930. Um, and buried with him uh, is his wife, Helen Heron Taft. These two graves have something in common. They were both sculpted by the same designer, James Earl Fraser, who designed this coin. That's the F for Fraser. Okay? The Buffalo Nickel was designed by James Earl Fraser, the same guy who designed those tombs. And the S is for San Francisco. I'd like to have this coin in my collection. <laughs> it's a nice one. I'd like to have the one with, uh, without the raised ground, too, but that would be worth about five times as much. And of course, speaking of presidents, how many of you remember this image of the temporary grave? The first time I was at uh, the Kennedy grave site was with the, uh, the picket fence. And uh, this is the eternal flame. And of course, Jacqueline Kennedy, of course, being a, being a French extraction, uh, she was familiar with the eternal flame at the French, uh, the French unknown soldier's grave beneath the Arc de Triomphe. And uh, she studied in, in, in Paris as well, and uh, decided with about 18 hours left till the funeral that she wanted an eternal flame at her husband's grave. And I have read the report of the quartermaster who made it happen. Uh, he got on the phone with the contractor, had a ditch dug in this location over behind some bushes, got, a, got propane tanks, um, and he got the shop, found a luau torch at a hardware store, and got the shop at Fort Myer to weld this shield around here so that uh, they would have a shield. And uh, uh, these, these pine boughs that were placed around here, Mrs. Kennedy would light this, uh, the uh, the Secret Service demanded that these pine boughs be totally soaked with water before Mrs. Kennedy reached down to light the eternal flame so that she would not be lighted with it. Um, and of course, uh, this is the, uh, this, in 1967, March 14th, midnight, uh, middle of the night, they pulled a backhoe up to this location and uh, uh, got the vault and casket out and moved it to this location which was over, slightly over um, on the side of the hill and just directly in line with that center line from the, from the Arlington House all the way down through the, across the uh, bridge and the eternal flame. Now when I was there, the eternal flame um, would blow out occasionally, but it would come right back up because it had electric, uh, electronic igniters here. And if the gas, the gas feed, of course, uh, when the wind blew hard enough, it would lay the flame down and then the flame would come back up when the gas feed, uh, when the gas feed could, could work. Um, this is the grave of Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. He died in the summer of 63. Uh, he, was, he was born alive but lived not quite two days, not quite 48 hours. And this is the grave of their stillborn daughter, um, Arabelle, who was, uh, who was stillborn. Uh, about a year before uh, Caroline was born, in 1955, uh, I believe. And then, of course, uh, they added this little stovepipe so that that doesn't happen anymore. The igniter does not, the, the flame cannot blow down anymore. And, of course, um, and the brothers, JFK, and we all, those of us who were, who were alive when it happened, remember exactly where we were when we heard walking into sophomore English at Theodore Roosevelt High School in Des Moines. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, everybody, everything stopped for that weekend. And uh, it was the weekend before Thanksgiving and, uh, and uh, everything just stopped still until Monday when the burial took place. Of course, Jackie died in 1994 and chose to be buried with her husband. She did not want to be buried with Onassis. 
She also did not want Onassis on her grave. But the Department of the Army, which runs Arlington, would not bury her without her official name of death on her gravestone. So this, uh, therefore, instead of saying Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, says Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis. This is Bobby's grave. Bobby was shot in the, in the uh, wee morning hours after the California primary in the kitchen of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles by Sirhan Sirhan. Um, he clung to life until early the wee hours of uh, D-Day of 68, June 6th, and died in the early morning hours. His services were the only services ever held at night in Arlington National Cemetery. The uh, funeral mass was in New York at St. Patrick's. They put him on a train, and Cardinal Cushing uh, was on the train, and Cardinal Cushing could not do the services in Arlington because he was sick, maybe heart sick. But the train had to slow down dramatically because an oncoming train had killed two bystanders. And Ethel Kennedy said, no more death. Slow this train down so that nobody else is killed trying to see see this funeral train going to Washington. They got there well after dark. They set up the temporary lighting with the generators. I'm sure that was, uh, that was a little bit distracting to have those motors running, but they buried him uh, around midnight, uh, midnight of that day. This, uh, while well, I was there, was just a, just a white wooden cross. This is, this is now marble. It's attached down here. Uh, but it was just a white wooden cross, and uh, every once in a while you'd get up, get to the tomb in the morning, and say, you know, just heard somebody stole Bobby's cross last night, and then they'd just bring out another one. Uh, and to the left is his youngest brother, Edward Moore Kennedy, who served 47 years in the U.S. Senate. Uh, that's the grave of Philip Sheridan, right there. Uh, Edward Moore Kennedy. Ted Kennedy was born on the 200th anniversary of the birth of George Washington. February 22, 1932. Washington, of course, being buried, being, being born on, uh, on uh, the February 22nd of 1732. And uh, his godfather was JFK. And JFK wanted him to be named George Washington Kennedy. And guess who had the final say? Joe. Joe, Joe Sr. had the final say. And so uh, he became named after a friend of, of, uh, of Joe Sr.'s, uh, Edward Moore, a longtime associate and, and partner in business. So uh, there is a memory stone for Joe Jr. He was, he was, he blew up in an airplane loaded with explosives as it was leaving England before it even cleared the coast. These planes, it was called Project Aphrodite. They were packing B-24s and B-17s full of explosives and flying them into where the Germans were building the V-2 rockets and the V-1 rockets uh, to, to take that, try to take that facility out. And uh, something happened with the, with the electrical fuses. Uh, the electronics aboard uh, the plane blew up before it even cleared, even got out to sea. And nothing was found of him or his navigator. Uh, they didn't have, of course, uh, uh, they didn't have time to bail out, so no, no remains were found. But he does have a memory stone of Joseph P. Kennedy, Jr. And Evelyn Lincoln, who was Kennedy's personal secretary. Remember that list of things Lincoln and Kennedy had in common, that Kennedy's secretary was Lincoln and Lincoln's secretary was Kennedy? Mm -hmm. Well, we do know that Kennedy's secretary was Lincoln, but we have no evidence that uh, Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, this is a Meg's marker. This is a, actually, I think, a work of art. This is the last one left. They were thinking about using these for the Civil War graves. They're, they had one drawback. They're cast iron and they rusted. So this one has been preserved. This is the grave of Philip Sheridan. That's the one I pointed out, right close to the house. And of course, when the Civil War generals started to die, that's when they all tried to see who could get closest to the front door of the Arlington house. <laughs> The biggest who could give the biggest slap in Lee's face, and of course a lot of the a lot of the uh, the reasoning behind Darlington becoming a burial place was as a way to get back at Lee and his family. 
Um, Lee never owned the property himself, but it was, uh, it was his home, and uh, it was in his wife's family's name for many years. But Phil Sheridan, I, I would say in the, in the pantheon of Union generals, uh, Lincoln had some duds, <laughs> uh, like McClellan, <laughs> to mention one. But uh, in the pantheon of, of generals, Grant, Sherman, and I would, I would, I would place, place Phil Sheridan as number three. Little Phil, he was about five foot six, ruddy complected, and uh, uh, his uh, his his uh, biggest claim to fame was uh, basically burning the Shenandoah Valley in the summer of 1864 to deny the Confederate Army a living off the land in the, in the Shenandoah Valley, so they could go across into the Shenandoah Valley and and, and uh, get fed, fed and resupplied. This is the grave of Phil Kearney. Phil Kearney. Now, Kearney, Nebraska is named after his uncle, Stephen Kearney. Phil Kearney was uh, from a, a, a family of uh, financiers in New York. He inherited a million dollars in 1836. He was independently wealthy. He did not have to work for a living, but his ideal was to be a cavalry officer. And he wanted to be a cavalry officer wherever he could be a cavalry officer. Uh, he went to North Africa between the Mexican War and the American Civil War. But he, uh, um, he lost uh, his left arm at Churubusco in the Mexican War. And uh, notice, his left sleeve is pinned up. Uh, he was buried elsewhere until 1912 when he was, brought, uh, he was brought here, I believe in Georgetown, actually. And he was brought, uh, brought here in 1912. Uh, with an equestrian. This is one of only two equestrian statues in, in, uh, in Arlington. The other is for Sir, Sir John Dill, who was, uh, who was liaison to, uh, to uh, FDR during the Second World War and died, and died here in America and is buried at Arlington. But uh, he used to ride, he rode into battle in the Civil War with his horse's reins in his teeth and his saber in his right hand. Uh, he made the mistake of riding into Confederate lines at Chantilly, Virginia. 18, September of 1862, he was ordered to halt. And instead of halting, he wheeled his horse and started off the other direction and was shot in the back by, by um, multiple sentries. Um, uh, he was killed on the spot. And uh, after he was killed, his friend, Confederate general from the, from the academy, A.P. Hill, came out and looked at him and said, my God, you killed Phil Kearney. He didn't deserve to die in the mud like this. Um, Abner Doubleday is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. The guy who, uh, who uh, some people credit with uh, the invention of the modern, modern game of baseball, although he never claimed it himself. Um, uh, the claim was that he was uh, he had sat down he'd sat down in uh, in uh, Cooperstown, New York, in the summer of 1836, and created from whole cloth the rules for the modern game of baseball. Well, that's uh, you know the, those rules that. Uh, that game evolved over time, but uh, for some reason, and he said it was due to his, uh, his West Point roommate, wanted Cooperstown to be known as the birthplace of baseball, that the myth was created and the myth persisted. A commission in the early 1900s confirmed the myth, and that uh, he had been actually the creator of baseball in Cooperstown in 1836, and so on the centennial of that was the opening of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Of course, its first uh, class of inductees included uh, Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth. But Doubleday was in Fort Sumter when it was fired on, April 12th of 1861. He was a West Point graduate, and he was a junior officer, and he was the first Union officer to request permission to return fire against the Confederate States of America, and was granted permission. So, of course, uh, Fort Sumter was reduced to rubble. Um, uh, no fatalities until the next day when a Union soldier who was firing a salute uh, as they were exiting was killed by the explosion of his gun. But uh, Abner Doubleday is buried in Arlington National Cemetery as Major uh, General of Volunteers. This is the guy who, uh, who, was who was the prime mover in Arlington becoming a graveyard. His name is Montgomery Cunningham Meggs. He was Quartermaster General of the Army. May 15, 1861, until the 1880s. He took over from Joseph E. Johnston. That name ring a bell for any of you sitting here? So if you're a Civil War buff, 
Joseph E. Johnston was a Civil War general on the Confederate side, also a West Point graduate, but he took uh, Johnston's place as Quartermaster General of the Army, and it was Johnston who made the final surrender of Confederate troops to William Tecumseh Sherman at Benton Place in North Carolina, um, April 26, 1865, 17 days after, after Lee surrendered at Appomattox. And uh, he surrendered to Sherman, and he and Sherman became friends. Yeah, Sherman who marched to the sea and burned Atlanta, but he and Joseph E. Johnston became friends. And at Sherman's funeral, Johnston refused to wear his hat. He got, he got sick, caught pneumonia, and died within a couple of weeks. But uh, that's that's an old story. That happens. That, that, there are more than a few instances of that kind of. He said he would not have co he would have he would have not have covered up the fight if it had been my funeral. So. Um, Montgomery Cunningham Banks became, uh, uh, became Quartermaster General of the Army, and then, of course, he died uh, in 18, uh, 1892. But he was Quartermaster General all the way until the 1880s. Uh, he was in charge of building a huge building that was called the Pension Building, the old pension, pension building in the District of Columbia. Uh, it required the use of about 15 million red bricks. And everything else in D.C. had been made out of limestone and marble. And William Tecumseh Sherman, when asked what he thought of this magnificent structure that Meggs had created, said it has one drawback. It's fireproof. <laughs> <laughs> Meggs, was, Meggs was a little bit full of himself. He put his name on everything he built. Soldier, engineer, architect, scientist, and patriot. And he's buried amongst his family. Louisa Rogers Meigs, daughter of Commodore John Rogers, that's a big name in uh, Navy, naval history. And their son, who was killed by a Confederate patrol, and uh, Meigs always thought he was murdered, executed, rather than caught, uh, caught in fire and in crossfire. This is the grave of General George Crook. General George Crook here, accepting the surrender of Geronimo. And Crook, um, Crook is a famous name, a big name in the Southwest. A lot of stuff in, in Colorado. There's a Crook, Colorado, named in, named in his in his honor. Um, he was initially not in. He was not a friend of the Native Americans, but he became became very sympathetic to the Native Americans as time wore on, as he as he was a, uh, an Indian fighter in the West. And Major General William Stark Rosecrans, this guy right here. Um, he got that smirk on his face permanently from a sledding accident as a kid. But he wore a smirk on his face throughout his life. And he could very likely have been the 17th President of the United States. During the Republican Convention in July of 1864, Lincoln sent a telegram to Rosecrans asking him to be his running mate. Rosecrans was a Union man, very much unlike Andrew Johnson, and he sent back a favorable reply, only this guy intercepted it and destroyed it. And so he, Lincoln proceeded and asked Andrew Johnson to be his running mate. And had this man been the running mate and had the assassination occurred as, uh, as it did, that uh, the face of Reconstruction would have been entirely different from what Johnson's Reconstruction looked like. This is John Lincoln Clem's grave, the drummer boy of Chickamauga. Major General, U.S. Army, well, he joined, he wanted to join up at age 10 in the, uh, in the Ohio 3rd. They rejected him. He, he tagged along with the Michigan 22nd. And the, 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 the myth goes that he was at Shiloh and he killed, a, he killed a Confederate colonel at Shiloh. Well, that's not true. Uh, and they, Disney made a movie with Kevin Cochran, Cochran called uh, Johnny Shiloh. And it was supposedly about this guy. But uh, 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 he did. Uh, he was at Chickamauga. And uh, was at Chickamauga. And a, and a shell uh, blew his drum up. And he picked up a, uh, a nearby uh, rifle and shot a Confederate colonel. Not killed, didn't kill the Confederate colonel, but shot the Confederate colonel. And he got promoted uh, to sergeant at age 12. <laughs> the youngest NCO in Army history, <laughs> John Lincoln Clem. He stayed in the Army until 1915. <laughs> wow. 
He was in the Quartermaster Corps. He was Assistant Quartermaster General and retired in 1915 at, uh, at the rank of Brigadier General. He wanted to go back into, he wanted to go back and fight in the, uh, fight in the First World War, but they wouldn't let him. Uh, and he was the last, when he retired, the last surviving uh, guy in the Army, uh, Army veteran from the Civil War in 1915. And this is the grave of Horatio Wright. Horatio Wright was a Union general, fairly successful Union general, but also an engineer. And Horatio Wright was one of the engineers that helped complete the Washington Monument. And his grave is on the front lawn of the Arlington House. And he's got his own little Washington Monument, his own little obelisk here, because he helped complete that structure. The Washington Monument stood at 152 feet from 1824 till 1878. It was affectionately known as the Stump in the District of Columbia. But he helped complete it. And so he was, he got about as close to the front door as the, of the Arlington House as anybody. So, uh, and very close behind is David D. Porter, Admiral of the Navy. And he and his beloved wife, who has no name, <laughs> and uh, this is temporarily erected. So that's been, been temporarily erected for about 100 years. Um, this is the corner of the Arlington House right here, and Mary Randolph is right over here. So uh, David, uh, David D. Porter. Now David D. Porter was uh, gained his fame at Vicksburg when he ran his gunboat, gunboats past Vicksburg. He transferred uh, Grant's troops from the west to the east side so they could encircle Vicksburg from behind. Uh, and finally end the siege of Vicksburg, but uh, he was raised with a with a uh, his father, David D. Porter Sr., took in a young man and raised him with David D. Porter, a young man also named David, David Farragut. <laughs> Farragut and Porter were were brothers, or not biological brothers, but raised together. William Henry Johnson was Lincoln's valet. And he was a free black from Illinois. And he came to the district with Lincoln. And he was a dark-skinned black. And most of the White House staff were, white, were light skinned blacks. So he was not accepted readily. But he was his personal valet. And in 1863, in November, Mary Todd Lincoln would not accompany Abraham Lincoln to go to the dedication of the Gettysburg battlefield because Willie was sick. Not Willie, but Thomas Tad Lincoln was sick, and she would not leave him because the last, uh, the last time that, that uh, she left uh, a sick son, Willie died. So William Henry Johnson uh, went to uh, Gettysburg with Abraham Lincoln. The night that he delivered the address, Lincoln fell ill with smallpox. William Henry Johnson helped nurse him back to health get him back to the District of Columbia and help nurse him back to health. And William Henry Johnson succumbed to smallpox on January 28th of 1864 and is buried in Section 27 in Arlington as a citizen. That was the designation of a free black in Arlington as a citizen. Civilian or citizen, okay? You see it both ways on graves in Section 27. Daniel Sickles is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And Daniel L. Sickles was a piece of work. And I mean that in the worst possible way. He was a congressman from New York, Tammany, Tammany Hall. And when he was 33 years old, in the 1850s, he married an Italian girl who was either 15 or 16 years old. Not uncommon back in those days. He found out she was having an affair. And he confronted the guy in front of the White House in Lafayette Park and shot him dead. Well, this was not just anybody. He was the district attorney for the District of Columbia. <laughs> and his name was Philip Barton Key, and his father was Francis Scott Key. Oh. And Sickles gets off scot-free. It's a bad pun, Francis Scott Key. <laughs> scot-free. He gets arrested. They put him in jail. They let him keep his pistol in jail. They put him in the warden's uh, in the warden's office so that he could receive his visitors, all his Congress buddies, coming to congratulate him for ridding the district of this scoundrel. 
And he hires a defense attorney, Edwin Stanton. And Edwin Stanton and his team mount the first ever successful temporary insanity plea and get him off scot-free. <laughs> Fast forward, Gettysburg, day two, on the far left flank. Daniel L. Sickles had, had uh, raised uh, a battalion in, in New York called the Excelsior Battalion. They became the Third Corps, and he takes the Third Corps from, I believe, Cemetery Ridge forward to the Peach Orchard, where they get slammed by Confederate artillery, basically decimated, and he gets hit below the knee by a Confederate ball. He saves the ball, and after his amputation, he donates his leg and the ball to the Army Medical Museum. It's not called the Army Medical Museum anymore, but it can still be, they can still see his ball and his, and his shattered leg, and he used to go visit his leg. <laughs> now, he petitioned Congress for a Medal of Honor for 30 years and finally got it because, his, because of his actions that confused Lee at Gettysburg and led to the ultimate Union victory. Well, those claims are spurious, but he did get his Medal of Honor, and he lived to be 96 years old, 94 years old, from 1820 to 1914. Say the good they die young, right? Moses J. Ezekiel was the first Jew ever admitted to VMI, Virginia Military Institute. Uh, in 1862, he was an okay soldier. He fought with the battalion cadets at the Battle of Newmarket, May 15, 1864, in the Shenandoah Valley. Was wounded but survived, but went on to become a war and became a world famous sculptor. He was a contemporary of Auguste Rodin, and he was commissioned in 1911 to sculpt this large hunk of bronze. That's about 30 feet tall as a Confederate memorial in Arlington because there were, at the end of the war, about 2,000 Confederates buried in Arlington. I thought it was a Union graveyard, but it had Confederates buried in Arlington. Many of them were repatriated. Families came and got them and, and dug them up and took them home. But on the back of this, it says, not for fame or reward, not for, peace, for place or rank, not lured by ambition or goaded by necessity, but in simple obedience to duty as they understood it. These men suffered all, sacrificed all, dared all, and died. And I think that can be said of many armies and many wars. But here's a Confederate grave, pointed. You saw Confederate Union graves are rounded at the top. This one's pointed. There are several theories, of course. Uh, one of the theories uh, is that uh, of course, some, this, is not, uh, this is not a Union symbol, this is a Maltese cross uh, and with a wreath in it. Uh, there are several theories, one of them so that's easily distinguished from a, from a, from a Union grave, but uh, one of the theories is it's pointed so that no damn Yankee would sit on him. Uh, <laughs> this kid didn't get the message, so he's sitting on it. This is at the dedication of, in 1914 with the flags of all the, uh, all the Confederate states and um, uh, still, one day a year, the United Daughters of the Confederacy are allowed to come in and decorate these graves for one day with Confederate battle flags. Yes, in this day and age. Still permitted. Ezekiel is buried at the foot of this monument. His was the first state funeral held in the National Memorial Amphitheater building. Of course, this is where the tomb is. And his, his funeral was held in there in and, and, uh, early 1921, before the internment of the World War I unknown. The second funeral held in this building, this beautiful building that seats 5,000, was the World War I unknown's funeral, and the third was for Charles Young. Charles Young was the third black to graduate from West Point. It took him five years, and he was given the silent treatment for five years. No one talked to him. He would converse with some of the some of the some of the um, some of the custodial help in German because he spoke German, and they would talk to him. But the cadet, other cadets never spoke to him. He was the first black to achieve the rank of colonel in the United States Army. And he is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And this is the amphitheater. This is the mast of the battleship Maine. And this guy. Grace, I asked a bunch of eighth graders who this was, and I got lots of answers. I got Einstein, I got Mark Twain, I got Einstein's hairdresser. 
<laughs> uh, but uh, this is Ignacian Paderewski or Paderewski. And Paderewski was a concert pianist. He was Polish. He was a concert pianist. He was a virtuoso pianist. He was a conductor and a, and a composer. But he is a national hero in Poland to this day. But he died in exile in 1941 in New York. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt proclaimed that he should lie in state beneath the mast of the battleship Maine in Arlington. Well, battleship Maine was in Havana Harbor from 1898 until 1912 when they harvested it and brought it to Arlington and created this memorial. This has the names of all 266 sailors who died in that explosion. 22 of them were African, African Americans. Well, that, well, what, what's, how, how does that work? Well, the, 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 the services weren't integrated yet, but naval officers had blacks serving in the officers' mess aboard battleship. So uh, their names are all aboard, all here, and within this, inside of here, his casket lay. And I could, we could go and look at it back when I was there, because his casket stayed there, and Franklin Roosevelt said, till Poland was free. Well, I think what Franklin meant was free from the Nazis. Well, it stayed there for 51 years, until 1992, until Poland was a free and independent state. And then, they brought him out with full military honors in 1992, returned him to Poland, and buried him in Krakow. Um, now, after the original explosion, February 15, 1898, most of the victims were buried in Cuba, but they were brought back to the United States and buried in what is called a mass burial, not a mass grave, but a mass burial on the 28th of December of 1899, three days before the turn of the 20th century. And these guys, the officials had problems with the photographers jumping down in the holes and, and jumping on top of the caskets to get pictures, and they told them to get the, get the, get the hell out of there. But um, this is prior to the mass burial of victims in the main, many of them unknown. The explosion was incredibly violent. Originally thought to have been caused by the Spaniards, but uh, the Rickover Commission in the 1970s determined the most likely cause was, uh, was a, um, a, an explosion of the magazine caused when a, um, a spontaneous fire of coal burnt through a bulkhead and lit the magazine of the ship. So all the ammunition in the ship blew at one time. Very violent explosion. Uh, and so many of them were unrecognizable and not being not identifiable, including this grave with four unknowns in one casket. So these were these were pieces. Uh, we all know who that is. Tr. That's Leonard Wood, and that's Fighting Joe Wheeler. Well, who was Fighting Joe Wheeler? Well, he was about five foot three to five foot five, and he was a Confederate general. And when the Spanish-American War came, he put on the blue coat again and fought with the United States Army. It was said during the heat of battle, he was, he was, he was said to have yelled at his troops, exhorted his troops to go get them damn Yankees. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, he survived. He went on, of course, he served, uh, he served eight terms uh, in the House of Representatives uh, from Alabama. But here it says, Major General, United States Volunteers, 1898, Brigadier General, United States Army, 1900, died January 25th, 18, uh, 1906, Confederate Cavalry, 1863. And like any self-respecting short guy, he built a nice... <laughs> uh, <laughs> William Jennings Bryan is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Of course, uh, the famous Cross of Gold speech uh, he made at the, uh, at the uh, Democratic Convention. Uh, he was the, uh, the standard bearer for the Democrats twice. Uh, uh, he ran against McKinley twice and lost to Taft. Um, in 1912, of course, lost, 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 lost the election, not, not, not to Taft. But, uh, um, uh, so he was, uh, of course, statesman, yet friend of the truth, soul sincere. 
Nebraska, uh, 3rd Nebraska Volunteer Infantry. He, I think he grew up in Illinois, but he was uh, he moved to Nebraska and took Nebraska as his own. And there he is with Clarence Darrow in Tennessee. And uh, just days after the trial, he died from a heart ailment. I think he was, he was, uh, he was worn out. Um, here's the Supreme Court part. Earl Warren. Warren Earl. Okay, Warren Berger. Earl Warren. Of course, the other Chief Justice I've already mentioned, William Howard Taft and William Rehnquist. So there are four Chief Justices buried at Arlington and a number of Associate Justices, including Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. And he was wounded three times in the Civil War. First at Ball's Bluff, second at Antietam. He was shot through the neck at Antietam. And he sat down and wrote this note, okay? Uh, uh, a. Holmes, uh, O. W. Holmes, uh, I am Captain O. W. Holmes, uh, 2nd Massachusetts Infantry, son of Oliver William Holmes, M.D., Boston, Mass. I wrote this about an hour while I was lying, lying in a little house in the field of, of um, uh, Antietam. Uh, and this was his, these were his dog tags. If he, got, if, if he died, then they knew who he belonged to. And of course, uh, uh, if you want to read a really s sad and depressing book about death in the Civil War, read uh, This Republic of Suffering by uh, Drew Gilpin Faust, uh, president of Harvard University and historian uh, about, uh, about uh, how, how few people were really identified in the Civil War. And here's a shot with five chief ju five justices, Chief Justice Berger, uh, William Brennan, Potter Stewart, Thurgood Marshall, and Harry Blackman, uh, all in a row. No other cemetery has more than three Justices. Arlington has four chief justices and eight associate justices buried there. Also, William O. Douglas, well, I was just talking about Hyman Rickover, father of the nuclear navy and the, uh, the, the head of the Rickover Commission that determined that the, mat, that the, the Maine was not an accident. Arthur Goldberg and Hugo Black, simple GI headstone. And Thurgood Marshall, Medgar Evers is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. He was field secretary of the NCAA, uh, NCAA, NAACP and was murdered after John Kennedy's uh, first nationwide civil rights speech by Byron, Byron Della Beckwith, a, uh, a uh, avowed white supremacist. Uh, but Della Beckwith was finally convicted, but he was uh, quartermaster corps, tech five, and uh, decorated uh, during the Second World War. And these, if you ask, these are mother's tears. It's a Jewish tradition, putting a rounded stone on a loved one's grave, saying, I love and miss you. Spotswood Poles was considered the black Ty Cobb, which is a little bit ironic if you know the Ty Cobb is an incredible racist. <laughs> but, uh, but Spotswood Poles was, uh, was a star of the Negro Leagues before and after the First World War. Purple Heart, um, 93rd Division. And uh, I think I believe the 93rd was one of the divisions that fought with the French, uh, and uh, was under French command. But uh, uh, he uh, he had a string of batting averages that were in the in the 400s. Uh, one was the, the lowest was 397, the, the highest was about 484, and he batted 610 against major league pitching in exhibitions. Daniel Chappie James, General, United States Air Force. He was the first. Black uh, general to wear four stars. He's wearing three here, but uh, um, he was quite a character. Uh, I would love to have met the man. And this is James Parks. James Parks was born a slave, owned by George Washington Park Custis in 1843. He was liberated by Union troops in 1861. And uh, he was hired by the Union Army to build the brick barracks that I lived in in Fort Myer, Virginia. So he became a brick mason. When we built all the barracks, he became a grave digger in 1865. And he dug graves in Arlington by hand, like they all were, from 1865 until 1925. Mm. Mm. When he retired, four years later he died. 1929 was given, was given special compensation. An interesting, respectful, kindly old Negro. We don't write stuff like that anymore. But he, along the way, fathered 22 children, 
with two wives. Uh, but in 1929, and he, when they, re, when they uh, redid the Arlington House and tried to make it look like it did back in the, uh, in, uh, before the Civil War, in the antebellum years, uh, he was a consultant. He was asked what things looked like, where they were in the house, and what was used where. So uh, uh, he died August 21st, 1929. This is the grave of Matthew Henson. Matthew Henson was Robert Perry's right-hand man. They went to the Arctic together. They each had, they each had Inuit families. Uh, but he was probably carrying the flag to the North Pole when it got planted. If it, if it indeed got there, the National Geographic thinks it probably didn't. I think they were a few miles shy. But this is the grave of Perry, the discoverer of the North Pole. Now, I think we knew it was there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think... First to, first to get to the North Pole, uh, and then this guy, the real-life inspiration for Indiana Jones, the discoverer of Machu Picchu, Hiram Bingham. Now, they say he discovered Machu Picchu, but the locals probably would uh, argue with that. And Frank Buckles is buried up on that hill, Corporal U.S. Army, World War I, born February 1st, 1901, died February 27th, 2011, at 110. The last surviving World War I veteran, buried up there with General Pershing. And this is Sergeant Edward F. Younger, the guy who laid the wreath, who laid the flowers on the uh, World War I unknown to select him. Purple heart. And here is Lorimer Rich, designer of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier within sight of his work in Arlington. And of the six, three are buried at Arlington. Michael Strank, the old man, Rene Gagnon, and Ira Hamilton Hayes, the Pima Indian, who died tragically in 1955. Bill Malden is buried at Arlington. Mm -hmm. And there are memorial sections. There are 12 of them in memory of Alton Glenn Miller. The boy from Clarinda, Iowa. And this is a memorial section. These memorial sections are on the steep hillsides because it's a place where you can't do a flat, full casket burial. So they make a memorial sections. And these tombstones are too close together for a full casket to go between them. Um, Lieutenant Commander, U.S. Navy, lost at sea. Okay. Harry Rosen. Purple Heart, USS Rona. The USS Rona, there was no such ship. There was an HMT, His, His Majesty's Ship Rona, that was sunk in the, uh, that was sunk on November 26th by a radio-guided uh, uh, Nazi buzz bomb. And uh, it, it was not publicized. This was, it, it was a top secret for a number of years because 1,015 American soldiers died in that troop ship. This is the tomb. This is the hedge on one side, and on the other side of this hedge is my favorite section, <coughs> section 7A. And if you walk section 7A, you'll know about, about a third of the names in this section. Frank Reynolds, ABC News. John Mitchell. <coughs> Al Haig. Joe Lewis Barrow. His real name is Barrow. But when he signed up for a fight, they couldn't finish, didn't have enough room for his last name. <laughs> and so he became known as Joe Lewis. The Brown Bomber, World Heavyweight Champion, 1937 to 49. Now, he died heavily in debt to the IRS. And his friend, Max Schmeling, paid for his tombstone and his funeral. <coughs> Max Schmeling, didn't they fight? <laughs> Schmeling beat him in 35. I believe that uh, Lewis beat him in 38. And they became good friends after the war was over. Um, uh, Schmeling had uh, Schmeling had the uh, uh, Schmeling had the rights. And he was a Coca-Cola distributor after the war in West Germany. Uh, but right next to him, right next to him, is getting Legion of Merit. Right next to him is Lee Marvin. Now, I think Lee chose to be buried next to Joe because 
Joe predeceased Lee. Dirty Dozen, and my favorite Western, The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. It's us. Strother Martin, Lee Van Cleef, and Creighton Abrams. He was the point of the spear of Patton's Third Army as they drove through France and toward, uh, towards Belgium, towards Bastogne. And uh, they relieved the 101st Airborne at Bastogne uh, after, during the, their little bur during the bulge. Um, and uh, he, was, uh, he was in command of, uh, he was in command of troops in Vietnam after, after William Westmoreland. Um, and came home in 74, uh, came home, well, he died not long after coming home. But his wife, Julia, uh, started the Army chapter of the Arlington Ladies. And if you know about the Arlington Ladies, they're officers' wives that started by Gladys Vandenberg in 1948 that were officers' wives would show up at every funeral for their service so that no servicemen would go into the ground without somebody representing the family, the family or somebody representing the family. And that's what the Arlington ladies did. They represented the family in absentia. Section 7A has Jamie Doolittle of Doolittle's Raiders. Mm -hmm. Medal of Honor, of course. Uh, and uh, I just read um, Eisenhower's Crusade in Europe, and Doolittle was, uh, was, was crucial in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the air power that was used in Europe. And Happy Boynton, about 30 feet from Doolittle. Black Sheep Squadron, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Old Man. Clark Clifford, mm -hmm. Maxwell Taylor, and Matt Urban. Nobody knows who Matt Urban is. He was the most decorated American soldier in World War II. Oh, wasn't that Audie Murphy? Well, it wasn't. Matt Urban had basically matched medal for medal with Murphy, only he didn't get his Medal of Honor until 1980. So Murphy got all the all the hoopla until, until Murphy's death. And uh, Murphy died in a helicopter accident in 1971. And then Urban, after he got, he was considered by Book of Records, Guinness Book of Records, to be the most decorated American soldier. He had, um, Murphy had um, uh, one Purple Heart with two oak leaf clusters. Matt Urban had Purple Heart with six oak leaf clusters. He needed seven times. Carl Sitter, that's a local, that's local interest when I'm at home. He's from Pueblo, Colorado. Cap Weinberger. Mm. And this guy's not in 7A, but this, this is a demonstration of the incredible, the incredible uh, nature of Arlington. I was walking from Kennedy Grave up to the, to, to the Arlington house, and I looked over and I saw this name. And I realized that name rang a bell because my dad's sister ship, the Fisk, my dad was on uh, Destroyer Escort 139, uh, the Farquhar. The Farquhar got the last sub kill in the Atlantic two days before Germany surrendered, May 6, 1945. He sent U-881 to the bottom, but his sister ship, DE-143, was the Fisk. Well, I looked it up. This was the name. He was the namesake. And here's the Fisk, just getting, after getting hit, the midship. My dad was ship cinematographer for DE-139. And I have the original 8 millimeter footage of these two pieces going under and the rescue of the survivors. And John Shalikashvili. He was a man without a country. His parents were, his parents were em immigrants, but they, were, they had no country. He was born in Warsaw in 1936. He was drafted in July 1958. Said, I hope to always be a soldier. He became a four-star general and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Leonard Wood. This is the medical part. Uh, you saw his picture earlier, yes. And Walter Reed, the guy who figured out yellow fever, okay? That it was mosquito-borne and the, the, the species of mosquito that carried it. And then any Rotarians in here? Albert Sabin, the guy who invented the oral polio vaccine. Uh, Rotary, Rotary, Rotary in the world owes a huge debt of gratitude to him. And Michael DeBakey, mm -hmm. 
guy who invented all kinds of heart valves and heart machines and, and uh, was given the Legion of Merit. He was also given the uh, uh, Presidential Gold Medal by Richard Nixon. Later found out that he was on Nixon's enemies list. <laughs> Died in 2008 at the age of 100. Claire Chenault of the Flying Tigers. And this guy, Thomas E. Selfridge, first human being to die in an airplane accident. He was flying around Fort Myer on September 17, 1908, with Orville Wright at the controls. The propeller broke, the plane went in, the engine block hit him in the back of the head. Fractured his skull. Orville White survived. Thomas Selfridge died. And he's buried in Arlington National Cemetery about 500 yards from where the plane crashed. <laughs> Any guesses? Dashiell Hammett, the guy who wrote the Maltese Falcon, the Thin Man, the Red Harvest, the Dane Curse, the Glass Key. And, uh, Work Sydney Green Street, Mary Astor, Peter Laurie, Humphrey Bogart, and the Boyd. <laughs> and he served in two wars. He was uh, he went into the army in the First World War, got tuberculosis, got a medical discharge, and then when the Second World War rolled around. He finagled an assignment, editing a GI newspaper in Alaska. He had already been a member of the American Communist Party. When he died in 1961, J. Edgar Hoover wanted to deny him burial at Arlington, as he had requested, and the Department of the Army, which administers Arlington, said, he goes in. He served honorably in two wars. He qualifies. Francis Gary Powers, a U-2 pilot. Bridge of Spies. John Glenn. Virgil Gus Grissom. Next to him, Roger Chafee, who died with him in Apollo on Fire. The third, Ed, Ed White, is buried at the, uh, at the uh, at West Point, his alma mater. And notice the date, January 27th. And then here we have uh, Stuart Rusa, Command Module Pilot, Apollo 14. And here we have Jim, Jim Irwin. And Dick Scobie, Commander, Space Shuttle Challenger. Notice the date, January 28th. January 28th. Michael John Smith, Captain, of the United States Navy Pilot, Space Shuttle Challenger. And the unidentifiable commingled remains of the Challenger astronauts. Laurel Clark from Columbia. David Brown. And Michael Anderson. And the unidentifiable cold mingled remains of the Columbia crew. Body Murphy. And Jumpin' Joe Byerly. Not many people have heard of him. He was from Muskegon, Michigan. The only person to have fought with an American and Soviet uniform on. He parachuted into France. He got captured. He escaped. He went towards Russian lines. He could hear the guns. He surrendered with a pack of luckies. <laughs> Melkonsky, Melkonsky. Said, friend, comrade. And they took him in and they let him, he was a demolitions expert. They let him fight for a couple weeks until he got wounded. Then they sent him back. But he fought with, he fought with a, in a Soviet uniform. <laughs> and this is a grave marker. Up until 1947, you could use anything, any size for your grave marker. And this was Wallace. Uh, Wallace Fitz Randolph, who was a, an artillery officer, he got a 1,200-pound Napoleon cannon for his marker. <laughs> Nathan Bedford Forrest III, great-grandson of the Nathan Bedford Forrest, Confederate cavalry officer and first Grand Wizard of the Klan. He was the first American general killed in the Second World War. He was flying a B. He was flying. He was piloting a B-17, uh, observing a bombing run by the Eighth Air Force. When he was shot down, uh, he was decorated for staying at the controls until his whole crew bailed out, and the plane exploded before he had a chance to bail out. 
His body was washed up on shore um, and repatriated uh, later on in the war. Leslie Groves, commanding general of the Manhattan Project. Jonathan Wayward, Wayne Wright, the highest ranking officer, American officer taken prisoner during the, during the Second World War. I says, what are you going to do, kiss me, Mac? <laughs> okay. Of course, MacArthur here, and he was left in charge of the, uh, of the troops left on the Philippines. Uh, he, passed that, uh, he passed that to, uh, to, um, to General King. Uh, he surrendered and was taken prisoner and ended up in Manchuco or Manchuria and was, uh, was malnourished. Uh, of course, his name before the war was skinny, but he was really thin. And I believe this photograph was taken on September, September 2nd of 45, at, uh, before the Japanese surrendered on board the Missouri. MacArthur, um, Marshall wanted him to get a Medal of Honor. In 42, MacArthur shot him down, because at that time, MacArthur outranked Marshall. In 45, Marshall put him up again, and he couldn't say anything because Marshall got his five, fifth star two days before he did. Okay? So, he couldn't do anything, and Jonathan Lee Rainwright got his Medal of Honor. Anthony McAuliffe, nuts, <laughs> when surrounded at Bastogne, and Omar Bradley. And of the, of, the, of the five stars, there were nine of them, okay? Uh, of, the, of the nine, five stars, five were buried at Arlington. Bradley, Marshall, of course, George Marshall was, uh, of course, general of the army. He was, uh, he was chief of staff during the Second World War. Um, he was also um, secretary, of, secretary of State for Truman, uh, and he was a Nobel laureate, got the Nobel Peace Prize for the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. So he was buried in Arlington. Half Arnold. Henry H. Hap Arnold, mm -hmm. the only one to have five stars and two services, the United States Army and the U.S. Air Force. And William Leahy, the first to get the fifth star on December 15th, 1944. And then on successive days, six more got him. The only two that were delayed, Halsey got his the next year, and Bradley got his in 1950 during Korea. The three who were, the four who were not there are Eisenhower, MacArthur, King, and, um, um, Nimitz, and Nimitz, okay? Those are the ones that aren't there. But I will tell you a real brief story. At Ike's funeral, it was our day off at the tomb, so we were called out to open doors. So the first door I opened, or the limo door, the first limo door I opened was the Shah of Iran. About that tall. The next door I get is Emperor Haile Selassie. He's about that tall. <laughs> about four foot ten. De Gaulle was one car down. He was about that tall. <laughs> next door I get is George Romney. He's about my size. Then the next door I get is Speaker of the House McCormick. He's, he's, he's pretty old. But uh, at the end of the funeral, Staff car comes out, from, this is at the Capitol building, comes out from underneath the east steps of the Capitol with red flags. And of course, I'm a E4. I'm going to salute a, I'm going to salute a, a, an O10. <laughs> so, so I salute. And as the car comes by, I don't move my head. But I just take a quick glance down with my eyes and I see a feeble hand returning my salute. Mm -hmm. And I look down and there are five stars on the epaulette. Omar Nelson Bradley returned my salute at Ike's funeral. <laughs> I will never forget that. Why? Neil McGee, first doctor in the U.S. Army. Daughter of Simon McGee, the astronomer. Grace Hopper, Rear Admiral. She was the... <coughs> She was a pioneer in computer programming. One day at Harvard, they tried to start the computer and wouldn't start, and they looked in panel F and there was a moth. The first computer bug. <laughs> that note card is in the Smithsonian. <laughs> Holly Josephine Prescott Baird Bennett, the first commissioned officer in the United States Army. 
also a surgeon. They didn't have a uniform for her, so she's had to sew this, but they had the hat. And the, and the officer's band. And this guy, I just stumbled on him one day, but I thought it was worth the picture. A Muslim who served in the U.S. Army in the Second World War. John Theron Coulter, who was he? Well, he was the fifth and final husband of Constance Bennett, the actress. Sister of Joan Bennett and Barbara Bennett. And the Queen of Technicolor is buried in Arlington, Maureen O'Hara. Her third and final husband was Charlie Blair, Brigadier General. And Ludwig Bettelmans is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Now, some of you may recognize that name, but some of you may not, because he, if you have daughters, you read his books, I guarantee you. In an old house in Paris that was covered with vines lived 12 little girls in two straight lines. They left the house at half past nine. The smallest one was Madeline. You wrote the Madeline books. George Westinghouse. Let's hear it for alternating current. Okay. And to wrap up, well, Dwight Philly Davis, the uh, the namesake of the Davis Cup of Tennis, and Henry Martin Robert, who was a Brigadier General Chief of Engineers, and after the Civil War, he went to meetings of veterans, and he got tired of them descending into chaos, and he decided to do something about it, so he created Robert's Rules of Order. <laughs> <laughs> I always come back to this place because many of these people chose Arlington, but Arlington chose these individuals here. World War II unknown, the Vietnam unknown, Korean unknown, and the World War I unknown. I took this picture with my little point and shoot. Got lucky, didn't I? This is a place that uh, draws me, and uh, whenever I'm here, I'm home. Any of us who guarded the tomb know that this is this is this is as this is as home as it gets for us. Uh, National Cathedral, tomb, and then of course the National National Memorial Amphitheater. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this little foray into into the into those who call Arlington home and will forever. Thank you for coming. While I don't qualify for in-ground burial at Arlington, I plan to go in the columbarium in my ashes. Hope it's not too hope it's not too soon. Where is the columbarium relationship? Um. Okay. Let me back up to here. If you went that way, down the hill towards the Pentagon, you would find the columbarium. I think that might actually be some of the columbarium right there. Okay and then running along from the columbarium up to towards behind the visitor center, there's a single wall, it's called the niche wall, and it also has niches in there. So the columbarium has, has I think, 75,000, uh, we'll have, we'll have when, when finished to completion, 75,000 niches. And uh, currently, all that is required for a columbarium is an honorable discharge, however, that's gonna change. In-ground burial requires Purple Heart, Silver Star, Distinguished Service Cross, Medal of Honor, retired. Uh, there, are some other, uh, there are some other requirements, and you can find it at the, uh, the arlington.mil website. Uh, there's a long list. But those are the basic, most basic requirements. Uh, up until 1967, uh, all that was required for burial in Arlington was a, an honorable discharge. From the Kennedy funeral until 1967, the request for burial at Arlington went from 3,000 a year to 7,000 a year. They couldn't bury 7,000 a year. Today, there are 25 to 30 funerals per day, Monday through Friday. On Saturday, there are about six, between six and eight, none on Sundays. 
So at current rates, Arlington is supposed to be full. No more, no more burials except spousal burials after about 2045. They were predicting predicting 2060 originally, but now that's about that's going to about 2045. Okay, so um, yes, Arlington is filling, but once it is filled with veterans, then spousal burials will continue until the last spouse spousal burial uh, in Arlington then will become a national heritage site, uh, much like Gettysburg. But Gettysburg doesn't have active burials anymore. A lot of the Civil War cemeteries do not. Uh, but um, Arlington will become uh, will be, uh, turned over to the Department of the Interior and uh, uh, will, be, uh, will, be, uh, will be administered thusly. Um, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Tom. Thanks to the Foundation for inviting me back to uh, get, a, get a second crack at this, okay? So, so I'm glad you all took the time on the day before Memorial Day. I have, I have a, 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 about a 10 slide show about the history of Memorial Day. You guys want to see it? Sure. Um, some ancestors of the Custis family were the Earl of Arlington in England. So they called it Arlington, Arlington House, the Arlington Plantation. So the Earl of Arlington was, a, was an ancestor of the, uh, the Custis family. Okay, you ready to go? So, and this is a very brief history of, of Memorial Day, and the, the opening slide I shows was probably the most dramatic Memorial Day at Arlington ever. And it was May 30th, 1958. And this is President Eisenhower, and this, these two are the unknowns from Korea and World War II. Um, in 1946, right after the end of the Second World War, it was determined that, uh, that an unknown soldier was going to be selected uh, in a proper manner, and ensuring anonymity, and ensuring that it could be from any of the, any of the battlefields. Uh, and that was going to happen on the 30th of May of uh, 1951. Something happened on June 25th, 1950. North Koreans came across 38th parallel, and that, that plan was scrapped. So after the end of, and they usually gave five years, after the end of the Korean War, in 53 to 58, they had their five-year window to select an unknown from Korean War and from World War II. And so that internment was done on the same day, Memorial Day, May 30th, 1958. There are claims, many claims to the first Memorial Day. They're all over the place. Almost any little town in New England will say that they had the first Memorial Day. <laughs> but one of the first documented Decoration Days occurred in Charleston, South Carolina, May 1st, 1865, the Washington Racetrack and Jockey Club. It had been a prison, a makeshift prison for uh, union, uh, union, uh, union prisoners, and 257 of them had died, mostly of neglect and starvation. And a team of slaves went out and buried them properly. And later that day, with their wives, they went and gathered flowers and decorated those graves on May 1st, 1865. Now the date, the, 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 the holiday that we track back, if we track it back, we do the paper trail back, goes to this guy. This is General John A. Logan. He was from Illinois. Uh, he was a reasonably successful Union general. Uh, but he was one of the founders of the Grand Army of the Republic. And I am old enough to have been driving around, uh, uh, driving around Iowa and seeing this, seeing this symbol on signs on the on the roads, the rural roads around. Um, um, and uh, so I have a, uh, I have a great, uh, uh, a great great uncle, who was who died in the Civil War and uh, donated his, his uh, diary uh, 
to the Iowa Historical Society, which was which was printed in the uh, in the digest of the, di the digest of the Iowa Historical Society. And Tom, would you would you would you pronounce it for me? The Annals of Iowa. The Annals of Iowa. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't it the Palm the Palm the Palm Yeah. Three and three editions. <laughs> And it was mostly boring, but the last, the last, the last pages were pretty exciting. <laughs> right before he got shot. So uh, he was one of the founders of this organization, and he was its third commander in chief. And he was its third commander in chief in May of 1868 when he proclaimed General Order 11 of the Grand Army of the Republic established the first ever Decoration Day to be held in Arlington on May the 30th of 1868. And so it was. And this was one of the centerpieces of that place. This was the mass grave of Union unknowns that had been placed by Montgomery Cunningham Meggs in Mrs. Lee's Rose Garden. He buried the skeletal remains of 2,111 unknown soldiers in a pit about 10 feet deep and 20 feet in diameter and put this marker on top of it. So, um, this was the, the centerpiece, but the speaker spoke from the portico. And the speaker was Representative James A. Garfield. And Garfield's quote from that day was, we must never forget that victory to the rebellion meant death to the republic. And then, four years later, in 1872, they continued on an annual basis observing Decoration Day here. Frederick Douglass was the featured speaker. And he echoed those sentiments, we must never forget that the loyal soldiers who rest beneath this sod flung themselves between the nation and the nation's destroyers. And this place was created in 1874, so this was, the, uh, this was where the speakers would speak until the creation of the National Memorial Amphitheater. Um, but as I mentioned, every, lots of little towns in New England, <laughs> including Waterloo, New York. And Waterloo, New York is, has the distinction of getting a congressional proclamation that this was the birthplace of Memorial Day. So if you can get legislation through that something is true, <laughs> then I guess by golly it is. <laughs> so Waterloo, New York did get a presidential proclamation, a, a, a congressional and presidential proclamation on May, May 5, 1866 was the first ever Memorial Day. But the May 30th, that stuck until 1888, when it became, uh, the name became changed to Memorial Day. And this, of course, is the National Memorial Amphitheater, and this is still where the President comes and speaks on, on, uh, on Memorial Day, uh, after laying a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknowns. Um, and then, in 1968, they messed with it. 90th Congress of the United States of America. And it says the following legal public holidays. So Memorial Day, the last Monday in May. And listen to this. Veterans Day, the fourth Monday in October. Well, guess what happened? Nobody liked that. <laughs> and it didn't stick. So uh, people just stopped paying attention, uh, except federal employees who got the day off. So. Uh, so, the uh, Veterans Day on 1978 was officially moved back to the original date, which was, had been Armistice Day before, which was November 11th. Um, and, then, and then, so, the, 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 main, the main driver, a lot of the driver behind this was the travel industry. And they wanted those three-day weekends where all those federal employees had a paid, had paid vacation, money to spend, and a day to do it in. Uh, so, uh, this was, uh, and of course, you know, they had to say Christmas Day, December 25th, and, you know, they don't leave anything to chance, you know. Uh, so, and then Washington's birthday, the third Monday in February. So they didn't, it wasn't called President, it wasn't known as President's Day in the original legislation. It was Washington's birthday. Uh, just close, they, they ballparked it and they got it close. Uh, to February 22nd. So, uh, and, uh, and every Memorial Day, whether it is the last Monday of May <laughs> or the 30th, and my last day on duty, I came off duty at 7 a.m. 
on May 30th, 1970, and that was the last year that by law that that was indeed Memorial Day. Uh, by happenstance, it occurs every 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 uh, seven years. But uh, uh, my last last day coming off duty at the tomb was uh, May 30th, 1970. The next year, it was on the last Monday in May. So this is called Flags In, and there are over 300,000 graves in Arlington. The old guard gets to put a flag on every last one of them. Okay. So, if you have a chance tomorrow, and you have a loved one's grave, who uh, is in the area, go pick some flowers, or pick your neighbor's flowers, or I don't know, pick some of your own flowers. <laughs> and go decorate your loved one's grave, because that's what it was for. That's the idea. That was the idea. That you took that day and you did that. You didn't make it a day to go to the beach or go to the cabin or barbecue or whatever. That was a day to honor those people. To honor those, you know, uh, all gave some, some gave all. And uh, to honor those people who gave all is Memorial Day. So I'm going to take this tie off and get on the road. <laughs>